Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Akash Pound. Um, I'm a senior fellow of the Institute for Government in London, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here in Liverpool um, chairing today's event with Steve Rotherham, Mayor of the Liverpool City Region. This is the first event in a series we're just kicking off um, on the theme of devolution, levelling up and local leadership, featuring uh, local leaders, mayors from different parts of the country. And um, very, uh, very, very great pleasure to be kicking it off in Liverpool. Um, this series and our wider research programme on devolution is kindly supported by the Joseph Roundtree JRSST Charitable Trust. So many thanks to them for their backing of our work. Um, this event is taking place live in the authority chamber of the Little Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. And, and many thanks, Steve, and, and to your team for um, enabling us to, to hold the event uh, right here on location. Um, the Combined Authority, um, as, as many people will be aware, is formed of the, the leaders of the six local councils in the Merseyside metropolitan area, and it's chaired by uh, Steve Rotherham as the directly elected Metro Mayor. Uh, Steve was first elected to that role in 2017 when it was that the post was created as part of a devolution deal that transferred a set of uh, powers from Whitehall, particularly over uh, transport, regeneration, skills, housing um, related uh, functions particularly around um, economic, uh, economic powers primarily. And then Steve was uh, re-elected uh, nearly a year ago now to a second four-year term. Um, prior to that, um, Steve, you were an MP, and before that you were, um, for a while, I think, Lord Mayor of uh, Liverpool City, which is a different kind of mayor to, to, to your role Very now, of course. Um, Liverpool City also has a directly elected council mayor, <coughs> just to add to the slight confusion, um, which and we'll, we'll come on to actually um, exactly the, the, the specific functions that um, you carry out. So uh, we've got nearly an hour for this event. Um, I'm going to be putting a series of questions um, to Steve uh, about his role, his priorities, um, the levelling up agenda in particular, how he is or perhaps would like to be working in partnership with central government on uh, improving the economic and, and social prospects of the region um, and also what you see as the, the future of, of devolution. Um, very keen to leave a good amount of time for questions. Um, we have, I think, a, a good sized live audience uh, watching um, online. So anyone who is watching our live stream, you can submit questions using the Q&A function, which should be visible on screen. Uh, you can also upvote uh, people's questions that you, you're particularly keen for me to, to, to put to Steve. And in the spirit of direct democracy, I'll, I'll try to pick the most popular ones. Um, and uh, after two years of mainly doing events via Zoom, it's, it's great to have a, a live audience with us as well. So, so welcome. Thank you to everybody who's, who's joined us today. Um, and um, I'll certainly be taking some questions from, from the floor as well. Um, so just a couple of other quick uh, things to flag. So we will be live tweeting the event from the IFG Events Twitter account using the hashtag IFGDevo, if anyone wants to um, engage on social media. Uh, the event is being not just live streamed, but recorded, and it will go live on our website uh, within 24 hours or so. Um, I've also just been asked to say to the people in the room, there's no fire alarm test planned. So if the alarm does go off, uh, assume it's the real thing and follow instructions um, as, uh, as, as, as appropriate. OK, so uh, let's get started. So I mean, Steve, first of all, just to reiterate, really grateful to you for um, hosting us here. And thank you for, for taking part. It's a great pleasure, Akash. And uh, it, as you said, it's great, isn't it, that you can actually meet people face-to-face -face rather than over Teams and Zooms, which we've been doing for far too long. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great to have that kind of conversation again. Um, OK, so um, I want to start with a question about your role um, as, as, as Metro Mayor and what the, the people of, of the region kind of expect from you. Because I think, you know, voters do tend to be 
perhaps healthily skeptical about more politicians, new tiers of government and so on. Um, so do you think the people of the region understand why this institution needed to be created and, and the problem it was uh, the, the combined authority and your own role as Metro Mayor was, uh, was put in place to address? It's a difficult question because um, unless we did some polling, you've got no certainty, have you, about whether people do understand it. The question was predicated on expectancy. What do people want? And what they want is to see the results of a Metro Mayor and a devolution deal in their lives. And that's going to take several years more um, because people want to see change, quite rightly so, by the way. We didn't um, go down this venture as a city region just to have the status quo or, or to do things as a sort of business as usual type way. We wanted to do it because we genuinely believe that we can take decisions and make decisions here that are more pertinent to people's lives who live here and we can respond much more quickly because we are nimble as an organisation rather than a monolith of government deciding those things for us. But it's interesting on expectancy. If you turn the question around and say to um, the electorate, would you prefer Westminster and Whitehall to make decisions or for them to be made more locally, I think overwhelmingly people would say they want decisions to be made in the Liverpool city region. Mm. Um, if you ask them what's the results of that devolution to the Liverpool city region, you'll get a mixed picture. Uh, and I think we need to step up our comms, not just as a city region, but right the way across the piece about devolution, because we're not used to it as a country. We're still the most centralised um, democracy, in politically centralised democracy in the OECD. And if you have a look at all the heat maps, you'll see the imbalance economically across the whole country. Mm. And I'd say that's because we haven't had it like a federal structure like in Germany. And we've been used to a top-down approach. Uh, and governments have proven that a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work. It certainly doesn't work for our area. Uh, and hopefully now with devolution, we're starting to see some of the fruits of the, the hard work we've had to put in because we had to build the foundations first. And I think that's what we've achieved. Yeah, and in terms of the, the, the specific functions that are held at the, the city region level, I mean, what, what are the things that you think it makes most sense to, 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 to be uh, considered at that regional level? Because, I mean, one criticism of, not specifically here, but generally sort of regional devolution or city regional devolution is that it can feel like a, sometimes a centralisation of power away from individual local councils. So um, what, what would be the, the, the things that you would argue most make sense to be considered at this scale? Anything that the government does, I think we, we could do other than national security issues. Um, I think we could do it better here. And we get a bigger bang for our book. That's not me saying it. Treasury have actually identified mm. through the funding methodologies that we get a greater return for UK PLC than government doing it for us. So uh, I'd say I'll take almost anything in all honesty, um, other than those big um, national or, 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 or pan-global issues that we can't possibly deal with on our own climate emergency. We'll do our bit here, mm. but it has to be a national strategy. But I'll, I'll give an example on, on transport. Um, there's no national government that would have said, OK, well, we'll buy the trains, but we're buying our trains half a billion pounds worth of brand new rolling stock. They're owned by the people. And what I want is to change the culture of the way in which public transport operates. So it's not just having nice, fancy trains, by the way, that are the most accessible in the whole country. They, they come absolutely in line um, with the, the platform. So there's no gap, there's no step. And we're doing that because we want to attract people who have been put off public transport because of accessibility issues. But we, we want to do these things to change behaviours and cultures because when I was an MP, I used to come out the House of Commons and I'd turn left because I lived down in Pimlico. And outside the bus, where the bus stop was, there'd be lords and you know politicians, you know, MPs and all that sort of stuff. And there'd be the cleaners and all the important people who do the real work in, in Parliament. But they'd all be queuing together. You don't really see that 
socio-economic demographic using public transport outside of London, and certainly not in the Liverpool city region. But we're changing that. If you have a look at how we attracted young people to start using it, because if, if they use public transport, there isn't a the reliance on the car. We can tackle climate emergency issues. There's really poor air quality in some of our areas, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But we can do that. Government wouldn't have done that before. Air Force. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know uh, transport is, is is one of your your main priorities, and I, I, I want to come back to that in a minute. Um, in terms of the overall um, budget uh, that you that you control, it's 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 in the region of um, a little under six hundred million, I think, um, in the twenty twenty one financial <coughs> year, which is a sizable amount of money. However, I mean, we did, the people uh, hopefully can see it both in the room and, and online, um, just an analysis of where the money comes from. And most of it is central government grants, which to varying extents, I think, are tied to specific functions and specific projects. You don't have much in the way of your own um, <laughs> revenue that you can you know, raise and, and, and use completely flexibly. Mm. Um, so I just wonder... Um, I mean, overall, do you feel you have the, the degree of spending autonomy that, that you need, or, or is it rather that in many cases you're, 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 you're tied to the delivery of centrally set priorities? I, I think we have more decentralisation than um, what we should have, which is proper devolution. Mm. And that delegation means that there's not enough flexibility within funding pots. So some of it is directly passported, to tell you the truth, through mm. ourselves. And then we, we use it within the parameters that government um, require us to and through our assurance framework. So that constrains the, uh, the innovation because what we try to do with the pots that we do get is to use it differently. It's no good just doing the same thing that government would have done because there's no point in having a, a devolved authority. Uh, and yeah, that, that's a bit of a frustration in all honesty. I, if we had more flexibility, I think we could do more. And when I had the German ambassador upstairs in, in this building, um, he was genuinely surprised that we didn't have a single pot. And then it'd be for us as a regional government to decide on how we spent that. Um, he didn't fully appreciate um, originally that lots of that stuff is for specific things and the government decide what those specific things are. Yeah, yeah, well, and we'll, we'll, we'll come on to the, the potential scope for further devolution and what the government is, seems to be saying it's in favor of as, as part of the leveling up agenda in, in, in a few minutes. Um, but I mean, in terms of powers that you, you, you do have, um, you've been in post five years, mm -hmm. um, you are trying to tackle deep set economic uh, issues, improving productivity and infrastructure and the transport system and so on. Um, is it therefore too soon to, for, for people to really notice the difference or are there concrete things that you would point to to show to, that, that you think show why devolution really does work and is already starting to improve people's lives here? In all of our six local authority areas, there are projects, there's at least one, but there are several um, projects that we can point to and say that has come about as a direct result of devolution. Of not, not necessarily me, mm. but having a Metro Mayor, having that single voice, having somebody who's responsible really to, um, to articulate the concerns of those areas at a governmental le level. A bit like London have had with three mayors, haven't they, over last 30 year period or whatever um, and so if it's been good enough for London to have that one voice why wouldn't it be right for, for areas like ourselves to have that one voice and, um, yeah I think people are starting to see some of the, the genuine hard work that goes into getting some of these long term projects delivered and there's one in St Helens called Parkside which has been on the books for donkey's years well it's breaking ground, it's, it's happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday I was at uh, one of our new stations called Headbolt Lane, that's happening now. If you have a look at what Sefton are trying to do on two huge projects there, they can't do that without the assistance of ourselves. Uh, over on the, uh, what's called Left Bank, over on the Wirral, um, on Wirral Waters, again, 
as a direct result. And then you've probably come through Runcorn on the train. Mm -hmm. If you were to get off at Runcorn, you'll see the enormity of the, the development there in something called the Runcorn Station Quarter. Government wouldn't have, have took the, the chance on these things. Now, when I say chance, I don't want people to say, you know, is it um, you know, a risk too far? They're not. They're, they have to be balanced and they're all very, you know, thoroughly looked at and, and due diligence is carried out. But then working with the local authorities, collectively we've been able to do that. And it is about collaboration. And, and look at, you know, I, I call the government out when I need to, but sometimes the governments have, have been a conduit for us to get some of that funding locally mm. because they've trusted in what we were saying and what we can deliver on behalf of UK PLC. It's not just about give us some money. This is ensuring that there's economic return for the whole country. Yeah, yeah. And um, on, um, on transport specifically, um, which is, I mean, as, the, as those figures show, and as you already said, kind of a, a key priority for you and, and the region. I mean, you've spoken a lot about um, the, the need for the region to have a, a London-style transport system, I, I, I think is the phrase. Um, so I just wonder what you think it's going to take to, to reach that objective. I mean, how much of this is just about more money in your view? Is it about more powers and joining up things more effectively? Um, and just by way of context, um, I've just got a second chart which shows um, spending on transport per person across the region. And we have the figures for the Northwest region because they aren't, they aren't actually broken down at, a, at a, a lower level than that. But clearly from that chart, London does get a higher amount of spending on transport. You know, there's arguably just things do cost more in, in London. Northwest is sort of in the middle um, in, in, in terms of spending, higher than some places, clearly from the chart. So I just wonder what, what you think it, it really is going to take over the, the coming years to, to reach that objective that you have. I don't think we can reach many of our targets outside of trying to attract people onto public transport without the need for a properly London-style integrated transport system. So climate emergency. Um, about a third of our emissions are from public transport, or from transport rather. Mm. So unless we can attract more people onto a genuine quality alternative to jumping in the car, we're, we're going to fail. And we're not, we won't fail here. I just told you we, we've invested half a billion pounds into rolling stock. On Friday in this very chamber, we made the decision to re-regulate re our buses. And again, that's five years painstaking work because the Act of Parliament, the Bus Services Act 2017, is almost impenetrable in, in parts. I think it was genuinely constructed to make it very difficult to re-regulate buses. But we've got through it. And I've met with our major bus operators, mm. and, and they've said they'll accept the outcome of our decision. Um, so hopefully we're not going to face a judicial review like Greater Manchester. Yeah, so that, I mean, the, 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 the result of the judgment from that is, is due today, I believe. Today. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't, hasn't been published yet. So are you not concerned then that anything similar will happen now based on conversations you've had with the bus companies? If, if Manchester's Greater Manchester is, is favourable today, I don't see why then any bus operating company would go through the same process with us because We've been meticulous knowing that um, there was every likelihood of a judicial review. Uh, and ours, um, at every single stage, we've consulted. So I don't think it's the same circumstances that Greater Manchester um, foresaw when they were going through. So I, I genuinely can't say that our bus operating companies would be anything other than wanting to work with us to deliver our option. Mm. And, and from your perspective, re-regulation, franchising of the buses is crucial because, as you're saying, it's going to enable you to create a more integrated transport system overall with, with smart ticking, ticketing and so on. Is that the, yeah. is that the key win from, from it for you? Well, I think the key win is if you can get public transport right, you connect people with opportunity. Mm. So it's not just people to people. That's really important, you know, the, the, the day to day lives. But for many in our city region, because we have low car ownership, it's the only alternative. And so if you've only got a bus every hour and that bus doesn't turn up and you're continually late with an employer, I guess what happens? Or if you turn up um, because you unfortunately happen to be on benefits 
you'll be sanctioned so that there are real social consequences mm. to not doing it. But we want to do it because genuinely, when I, when I was uh, the MP for Liverpool Walton, I, I'd, I'd, you'd get, off at Lime, uh, get on at Lime Street, get off at Euston. I never, ever looked at a timetable. I, I knew that if I missed the tube, there's one two minutes later, three minutes later at the most, and there's a queue of red buses outside taking it all over the place. Well, why is it good enough for London and not good enough for us? Because we're not second-class citizens, and I'll never, ever accept that we should have a second-class service here. If London have got something... Why are having the rest of the country? And it's because of that disastrous decision by Thatcher in 86, I think mm. it was, to deregulate buses, except outside the capital, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was for a long time uh, uh, oddity, I suppose, of, 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 of how it worked in different parts of the country. Um, so on uh, another big sort of policy area where, where powers have been devolved, um, skills and um, adult education... Um, where, like Metro Mayors and other parts of the country, you and the combined authority here took devolved control of um, a decent pot of, of, of funding for adult education. Um, I'm just quite interested. What, what have you been able to do, do you think, to tailor the adult education offer and, and, and orient the skill, skill system here to the specific needs of the Liverpool city region economy? I'll come on to the specifics, but the idea around us asking for devolution in the first place for adult education budgets was because we better need to align supply and demand. We, we've got really good colleges, genuinely good colleges, but they turn out what the colleges individually have in their business plan. Mm. And there was no overall strategy of how many X or Ys or Zs we were turning out to respond to the economic needs of the city region. So we've we're looking at that mix and trying to get that better because employers continue to tell us that they've got skill shortages. Well, how can you have skill shortages when you've got people who are absolutely desperate for an opportunity to work in those sort of places? So that's my huge frustration. Mm. But what we've done with the money <clears throat> differently is, uh, as well as that trying to align things, is we've got something called test and learn pilots. And we... Um, took some of that funding and said to our providers, not just colleges, but the private training providers as well, tell us what you'd do differently. If you had total flexibility, how would you go about certain things? Uh, and we've looked at all of those innovations. And, and one of them, for instance, is um, ESOL, as you know. Um, many people go in and it's somebody standing in front of a class and, and you know, cup and jogging. Instead of that, one of the colleges um, had a, a, a cafe and people went there and he started to talk to each other. And we found that the outcomes from that were much better because things were sticking because people were more informal and having a chat. And that's the sort of thing that I, I want to do where there's the, the rigidness of, of national um, interventions is this is what we do and this is how we always have done it and this is the way we're going to do it. We've looked at things differently. And, and, and I said before, Treasury are getting a bigger return for the money that we're getting. Yeah, yeah. well, that's, yeah, that's, that's obviously the, um, the, the, the purpose of it. And it's, it's very interesting to hear how you've gone about it. Um, OK, I want to move on to um, levelling up. Uh, it's in the title of, of the event, of course, and uh, it's kind of connected to, well, virtually everything the government's uh, doing. They somehow seem to link it to, to levelling up. Um, if they can. So, I mean, the, the way that the government has defined that term is very much in terms of reducing <coughs> regional inequality, reducing disparities in economic performance and um, health and education and other outcomes. Um, now, you're obviously from a different political tradition and, and presumably, um, you know, don't, don't agree with the government on, on many things. But when it comes to levelling up, do you think they've identified... Um, the right problems and uh, what do you think about the solutions they're proposing to them? I think Gandhi was once asked, uh, what do you think of Western democracy? And he, he said, I think it'd be a good thing. Um, and levelling up is something, how, how could you argue against levelling up? You know, do you want things to be more fairer? Yeah, okay. 
But the way the government have gone about it actually demonstrates the antithesis of everything that they claim that they want to do. So I'll give you an example, a concrete example. The government prioritised an area called Nosley. And Nosley is in, unfortunately, in, in um, some of the, the top ten in the indices of multiple deprivation for historic reasons. Um, but the government identified, they put a really good bid in, not me saying it, the government said it was a really good bid. Mm. It got knocked back twice, and on the third occasion, under levelling up, it got rejected again. So Nosley got zero pounds and zero pence from levelling up. But the former Chancellor's constituency got £147 per head of the population. Now, if Nosley got £147 per head of the population, they could have Disneyland there. It's, it could be absolutely transformed. It's just a huge sum of money per person. And they've got nothing. And all they wanted to do initially was to breathe new life back into the town centre, into mm -hmm. Hyde Town Centre. Now, I'll give you the, uh, the opposite of that approach by central government. Kirby Town Centre, so I was born in a place called Kirby. Kirby uh, hasn't had a supermarket for 34 years, and the town, the town it's called, the town centre, um, was really past its, uh, its best days, shall we say. And they needed something, and, the, and the, the private sector had let them down year after year, decade after decade, promising all sorts of things, never delivered. Myself and Councillor Graham Morgan, who's the leader of the council there, and um, the officials and, and the people in this building, came up with a, a plan, which very, very quickly then we could fund. It was went through all of the business planning processes. And it's there, if you go now, you'll see an absolutely transformed, regenerative um, uh, Kirby Town Centre. Mm. Um, and the people can actually see the benefits of the combined authority. That's because we genuinely do believe in levelling up and the, the new stations there. And if you have a look in, in um, Prescott, um, the new Shakespeare North Playhouse is being built, not in the future, it's going to be opening later this year. So there are tangible benefits of us doing things because we can respond more quickly than national government. Mm. OK, and I mean, what, what to you are the... Um the key indicators by which levelling up should be should be measured because I mean people might have seen that in the the government's white paper um, there's quite a lot of uh, well there's 12 missions that the government set itself uh, by to, to, to meet by 2030 underpinning those missions there's I think around 40 different performance indicators um, I think they're talking about developing e e even more. So from your perspective, um, what are the key things that um, you really want to see improve in the Liverpool city region? And before I actually <laughs> leave you to answer that question, I just wanted to call up a couple of charts on what I think are some of the, the, the key sort of things the government is keen to um, improve. Um, but it might be that you think we should be focusing on other things. So, I mean, first of all, this is analysis of the employment rate, and, and clearly levelling up is, is about job creation. Um, the pink is, is Liverpool City region, uh, the yellow is Greater London, the blue is the UK. Um, that shows that employment rate is, is obviously below the average in, in this region, but it, from that graph, seems to have, have closed the gap over that period, uh, which, which is presumably good news. Um, in terms of skills, NVQ3 um, qualifications, um, again, that, there is clearly that gap between the region and, and the national average. And, and here you can see, of course, London is, is quite a long way ahead, um, though there's been sort of improvement across the piece um, to some extent. And then thirdly, um, and probably more starkly, on labour productivity, um, the, the figures suggest that over this period um, there's been a disparity all the way through and, and if anything there's been sort of a, a flat line in the region. So um, my question is, as I say, well, are those the most relevant indicators first of all? Um, and if so, well, what do you actually think can be done to start to close that, those gaps over the next decade or so? Employment, skills and productivity are really important KPIs but that can't be just there. No. It has to be um, a little bit deeper than that. Sure. And I keep on saying to 
central government every time we go down there that the people in the city region, Liverpool city region, are, are no less talented than they are in London. Please don't perpetuate that one. What we have uh, a lack of at times is opportunity. It's not talent. Plenty of brilliantly talented people, uh, and, and they're not fulfilling their full potential because they're being held back. Now, the argument could be who's holding them back and why are they being held back, and mm. I, I get that. But some of the things that they're being held back on, um, for instance, are we want to harness the the power of the River Mersey, for instance, and become Britain's renewable energy coast. We want to look towards the green industrial revolution. We want to uh, ensure, for instance, that innovation, proper innovation, R and D, you know, uh, big ticket stuff, can happen here as well as in the Golden Triangle. We put a brilliant, again, uh, not us saying it, a brilliant bid in to, to government. Um, and it was rejected and instead only a couple of areas were picked. I think it was Manchester, um, Birmingham it might have been, and, uh, and Scotland, Glasgow. Glasgow yeah. yeah, these are for the innovation clusters, yeah. <laughs> Which frustrates the life out of me because um, we've got SciTech in Darsby, which is in the Liverpool City region, the most sophisticated computer in the whole country sits there. Again, looking towards the future and looking towards developing opportunity for people. Um, the fiber optic cables that link the UK with uh, North America come ashore in Southport, and that's in the city region. So we're actually, as we speak now, there's 212 kilometers of dark fiber going into the ground, linking these two huge assets in a digital loop. Mm. Um, this is the LCR Connect project. Yeah, LCR Connect, which gives us the fastest speeds in the whole country. Mm. So why wouldn't you want to use a, a national asset that just happens to sit in the Liverpool city region. Mm. And I think it is because the governments don't treat every area as equally as they should. Um, areas like ours for far too long have been shelved because there've been other areas that have been uh, pet areas. Uh, and that's why we try to change the relationship with national government. When we had the pandemic, mm. it was, Liverpool and the Liverpool City region that were the national test pilot for you know for um, the transmission. When we were coming out of lockdown, it was us who did the the mass uh, participation events. That was Liverpool City region again. We we need to change that dynamic, but the government needs to show goodwill as well. And when you've got a brilliant bid, which ours was, and it's rejected, then it's no good saying ah well, there'll be another chance later on they needed to, to mm -hmm. put that one in because all of those projects national pandemic institute uh national uh, packaging innovation center trying to change the world with uh, the packaging that we currently have which single-use plastic and all of those microplastics that end up in, in the water courses and in, in the rivers and oceans we could do something here yeah so even if they hadn't liked the full package why not pick out some winners from what we had and say we can't do the whole lot, but here's an opportunity for you to demonstrate how good you are, because we would have and we would have smashed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that was one specific thing that, um, as you say, some areas were, 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 were kind of picked o over yours. Um, there was also the announcement in the, in the leveling up white paper of further, what, they, what they've called trailblazer devolution deals, again, for Greater Manchester and, and, and West Midlands. <coughs> Um, were you uh, disappointed not to be chosen for, for one of those additional deals as well? And um, what, if you were to um, be engaged in another round of devolution, uh, another devolution deal negotiation, what specifically would you be looking for in terms of further powers from the centre? I wasn't surprised that we weren't. Um, in all honesty, let's have a look at Greater Manchester. They've had the Association of Greater Manchester authorities, so they've worked collaboratively for 30, 40 years, and they've got a track record, haven't they? And, and so that's what we need to do. Mm. Um, when people ask me why have they got a tram and we haven't, well, we were ahead with the tram. We actually had the plans for the tram. We bought the rails for the tram, and our local authorities couldn't work together. So theirs have, and um, whilst there'll always be an element of competition, mm. we need to work in collaboration when, when these big things come um, to us. So I wasn't surprised that. Uh, Manchester were in it. I wasn't surprised that West Mids were in it because 
uh, yeah, Andy Street um, is uh, one of the poster boys, isn't he, to try and humanise the, the Tories. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's, a, that, that's good for them. And I'm not jealous or envious of, of, of their success. I, I get disappointed if I don't believe we're being treated fairly. But I think we're quite embryonic, so we need to demonstrate more of what we can do for the government. Mm. And at times we've, we've, we've been a bit introspective, you know, and we're really, really good. And that, that doesn't cut it because you, you're going to compete not just with Greater Manchester or, or with West Mid or London. We need to be competing with international destinations, you know. We, we, We've got an awful lot to offer. Our brand is still absolutely fantastic globally. Mm. And we need to be pitching our tent alongside those people, not just trying to fight for um, crumbs off the table when it comes to a battle between us and, and other areas in the, in, in the Northwest. Mm, sure. OK, yeah, that's, that's, that's um, very interesting to hear. Um, and, I mean, in the white paper, the, the, there's, there's a lot of talk about... Um, devolution as one of the key pillars uh, from the government's perspective of achieving its the, the, these these objectives it's it's setting for itself, um, and I mean that's partly about these additional deals in Greater Manchester West Midlands. It's mm. partly about deals in new areas, the county deals, and so on. Um, it's also partly about at least from what they're, they're saying they're trying to do, changing the way that Whitehall operates and sort of embedding spatial considerations in policy making in a much more systematic way, having more people out in the, in the, the regions of England, and there's a few people in the room today, I think, from government departments, um, to have a kind of more um, structured relationship, I suppose, between central government and and combined authorities and, and, and local government more generally as well. So I just wonder, is that kind of um, thing something you welcome? And, and what would you like to see change concretely in how, in how Whitehall operates and how Whitehall engages with you? Again, if government is serious, then the opaque nature of funding distribution needs to be addressed. Um, you can't have the nosley scenario. You can't have a beauty contest for every pot of money sucks up resources it takes an awful lot of time and actually the government's sort of already um, aware of where those potential pots are going to end up anyway so I, we've long argued that the the treasury green book the funder methodology mm. needs to include something like social deprivation and that's how you can properly start to level up the country because those areas in greatest need would get favorable treatment for once and we're not asking for handouts I, I i'm always really conscious that people go oh, well you're just asking for more money i'm not i'm asking for the opportunity for us to get investment so that we can achieve some of those things the, the way you, you, you um, attack the uh, problem that we've got with productivity mm. in the liverpool city region is not by blaming people for being lazy it's by investing in new technologies it's by ensuring that um, you can attract those new industries. It's by giving the people who work in those the skills and identifying the skills needs and therefore the skills gaps so that you can do those sorts of things, which leads into the adult education budget. Mm. You have to have an overall strategy. And for far too long, government who work in silos have compartmentalized these things and said, well, we'll do a little bit there as if there's not a knock-on effect to all of the other things that you need to do. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the, the effects of Whitehall departmental silos on, on the ability of, of local actors to, to coordinate and join up, is, is, is that's an issue that comes up very frequently in, in conversations we have. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with you about that. OK, I'm going to move on to uh, questions very shortly. i just got a couple of final things I wanted to ask you. Um, so one is, so looking beyond um, sort of specific issues in uh, this region, um, there is in the white paper, or as I already mentioned, a commitment to negotiate new devolution deals in, I think, 10 areas, as well as expanding the, the, the Newcastle regional deal. So this map, for people who, 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 who can see it, shows the blue areas being where devolution has already taken place to some extent, and the deals are all 
quite different in various ways. The pink areas are where the government has said it's now open to, to negotiating new deals. But it feels to me we're in still very early stages of, of this process. Um, so I wondered what, um, well, what advice you would give to those areas as they seek to negotiate devolution deals. And in particular, would you advise them to go for the mayoral model, which is quite controversial with lots of, well, across lots of areas, actually. It's, it's not often very popular in local governments, but the government is very keen on it, and it's made clear in its devolution framework that if you don't go for a mayor, you won't get as many powers, basically. I'd, I'd say to those people who are in those pink areas, um, snap the government's hand off. Because if you don't, um, unfortunately, you'll be left even further behind. There's a great report from Michael Heseltine a few years ago um, who identified the benefits of devolution of doing things more locally. Mm. I think that's as you know as sound as it was then as it is today. Um, on, on the mayoral issue, we're not used to mayors other than Lord Mayors, and you <laughs> said about um, me being the Lord Mayor of Liverpool during um, 2008, the European Capital of Culture. The last European Capital of Culture, unfortunately, because of, of Brexit that we'll have in this country. But mayors globally, people understand it. So that there's, uh, Bloomberg runs this thing, which is a, a global mayors mm. uh, um, summit and, and programme. Um, where mayors share all of that learning and, and expertise and, and information freely. Uh, and I, I went over to, to one of them, it was astounding, because straight away in America, for instance, mayors, people know it means something. We haven't got, it hasn't got the same cachet here mm. as it, it has in other areas. But even when international delegations come in and it's, the mayor, they get that that's the person who has some sort of responsibility mm. for, the, for the geography. So even though people in this country are still confused, I have to say, especially in our city region, there are, I think, 11 um, individual roles with the mayor of some sort, you know, so Lord Mayor, City Mayor, Metro Mayor, and then each individual local authority has a mayor, and some parish councils have mayors. Oh, right, yeah. So There's it, a lot of mayors, it, yeah. is, it, is it confusing? Well, yeah, for me, <laughs> never mind anybody else. <laughs> so if we, can, if we can simplify that for people, and they get a flavour for what it is that the role is about, and it's not the ceremonial ones cutting ribbons and stuff, but it, it's something like what happens, the best way i describe it, uh, is what Sadiq Khan's doing. Mm. So if you have a look at Sadiq in there and you know, with public transport and what he's doing on climate emergency and skills and all that, yeah. that's what we're heading towards. We're a long way away. Um, and there are tiers of devolved deals, as you know. So Manchester has things that we don't have. But at least the role is that one point of contact, that one voice for a large geographical area that can stand up and fight for it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, great. All right, so um, let's move on to questions. So I've got a few here um, on my screen which have been submitted uh, virtually that I'll go to first, but then, yeah, people in the room, if you wanna think about specific things, I'll, 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 I'll come to you soon and there'll be a microphone passed around. Okay, fine, so um, there's a question here from, um, Alastair Baldwin, who is a, a transport policy specialist I know in, in Newcastle. He asks, um, we're talking about London style transport. Um, and he says, one of the elements of this in London is that the mayor there and TfL have control of, of major roads. Um, is that something you think uh, mayors and combined authorities elsewhere should be able to do? And is, that, is it a limitation basically on your ability to achieve your objectives? Well, we do have the key route network, um, but not some of the other major roads. And in all honesty, one of the things that I said earlier was that we're trying to take powers away from Whitehall and Westminster mm. and not from our local authorities. So powers that sit with them hopefully will, and we'll be the bridge then between ourselves and, and government. Um, the, the, it, it's an interesting question because actually it's not just about the roads, uh, it's about the fares as well and BSIP, the bus service improvement plans that we've all submitted, 
just today I was listening to the news and it, it, it's talking about the report that was leaked about four or five, six weeks ago that says that we're not getting three billion. We're going to get 1.2 billion. If we get 1.2 billion, then we're never ever going to be able to level up with London because their subsidies mean that bus fares there are about 150, I think, if you get on, on the bus in London and ours are, you know, three and four pounds per individual journey. There's a capped, there's an algorithm that's used with the smart ticket and that says that's the most that you'll use. You could travel all day in Liverpool and the Liverpool city region and every single journey mounts up until we can get the similar sort of level of sophistication yeah. with their public transport system for ourselves. We're never ever going to be able to do some of those right. things. So the, and on the, the key road network is only part of it. Okay, yeah, no, that's useful. And on the funding, I mean, there's another question here actually I'll throw in um, about funding of, of, of transport. And, and I mean, the specific question here is, whether mayors in the UK would benefit from a system like the French, I don't know if this is a system you're <laughs> familiar with, a fr the French Versement Mobilité, which is a local payroll tax supplement to fund transport. Um, so I don't know if you have thoughts about that specific model, but let me expand the question to, do you have, a, like, un unless there's simply bigger grants from the centre, which at the moment, you know, there is a set budget presumably, do you have ideas of other funding models or other forms of, say, tax or uh, local revenue that, that would actually help you in that regard? Yeah, we, we spoke to government about um, land value uplift. Right. Uh, and that could be used to, um, to go back into the pot for more investment, which, again, then you, you'll get a return on. Um, we asked some years back for the government to look at, at tourist tax. Um, there are literally millions <coughs> of people who visit the Liverpool City region. And I say Liverpool City region, primarily it's Liverpool, but it's not just Liverpool. In a few weeks' time, there'll be the Grand National. And we call it the Liverpool Grand National. It's actually in Sefton. So um, we'll get people staying in Sefton mm -hmm. and in hotels towards Southport, you know, for me and Ainsdale. Not. Yeah. Um, so if we had something like that, and we have the golf, don't we, over in the Wirral? So uh, something of that nature yeah. and then we could reinvest that so we're not just looking all, all the time at the quantum from central government yeah. i don't think it's fair that what we get from central government that's a different argument what can we do for ourselves and we're always looking at where do we need to change what we're doing so that we can maximize the benefits yeah yeah tourist tax is an interesting one i know some of the other metro mayors are, have been looking at that as well well um, jamie, jamie driscoll's also looking at fiscal devolution so if you have a look at his paper it's really interesting yeah he's leading some work for the group of uh, the M10 group, in the, I believe, isn't it? Yeah, very interesting. Um, by the way, I'm not sure everyone else in the rest of the country calls it the Liverpool Grand National. Maybe you do that here. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, OK, I want to go to uh, questions in the room. So I think there was one uh, yeah, here and then one there. Um. Thank you. Hi, Ellie McNeil, Chief Exec at YMCA Together. Um, this morning I chaired the Health and Wellbeing Network, which is a network of about 250 charities and uh, community organisations working around health and wellbeing across the city region. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear the, um, the abject poverty that we've got in the region and the impact of all of the challenges that the region have faced on, on people in a kind of day-to-day -day basis. You know, women who are able, unable to afford nappies for their children, milk, etc never mind eating themselves um, you know and, and the voluntary sector is is really nimble and flexible and responsive and uh, and closest to our communities in hearing those stories and really understanding what needs to happen uh, for people in that situation to level up and, uh, and I'm really interested in how we genuinely hear the voice of the voluntary sector and then in turn the voice of our communities in terms of what they need to, to level up in the city region okay thank you yeah, yeah. Um, Thanks for the question, Ellie. You, you'll know that when I was first appointed, I, well, I was first elected, rather, uh, I appointed uh, Ellen Loudon um, because there's the VS6, which is the group of voluntary and community sector organisations. Uh, and I couldn't go around all six, so I needed somebody who could um, articulate the concerns that the voluntary and community sector have. During lockdown, you'll know, and, and this is another one of those things about flexibility, in 24 hours, we set up 
something called LCRKs, a charity. Mm -hmm. And we were able to draw down national and local funding and crowdsource and all sorts of things. So we got about two and a half million quid. And that was distributed via uh, the volunteering community sector. And as, if you like, the state retracted in part because of the pandemic and because of the fears of transmission, the volunteer community sector stepped up. And not just the volunteer community, ordinary just volunteers stepped up as well. And we were able to get that funding out, which not only sustained many of those volunteer community organisations to get them through that really sticky period, but they went to the most vulnerable and isolated people in our communities. And we've got a cost of living crisis at the moment with, you're saying about heating and eating. No one's going to be able to afford to heat soon, are they? I mean, it's, you know, the exponential increases are really scary. So again, what, what are we trying to do? Well, on, on the heating issue, we've got a retrofitting program that's happening now. It's another, not another pie in the sky. I went round to um, some fella's house and he was saving 25 pounds a week because of the interventions that we've made. Now, that literally is life or death for some people, isn't it? You'll, you'll know the abject poverty that some people live in. So 25 quid a week is, is fantastic. We want to expand that much mm. more. Again, the government have set climate emergency targets. A third of emissions, believe it or not, are through uh, domestic properties. So we need to tackle that one as well. And you can have the win-win where the government achieves its targets. And of course, what we do is help some of the most vulnerable in our communities who, by the way, are paying uh, an energy premium because many of them, many of them are on um, card meters and you pay more per therm for a card meter than you do from a direct debit. Yeah. So we're doubly hitting these people who are the most vulnerable. So we are trying to, to look at it and I'd, I'd love to be able to, to speak to you about some of the great things that we're doing to level up that playing field. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is you'll know that socially trading organisations have put money into a pot as well to try and include them Whereas beforehand, they could never ever bid in for some of those big pots of money. But they're now winning contracts and delivering stuff on behalf of, of those vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So yeah, there's one more question here and then, oh, there's a few other hands. I'll bring in a couple of other people. Uh, maybe we'll take two or three questions at once and then we can address them. We'll see if they're connected or not. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, M Michael Parkinson, University of Liverpool. Um, thanks for it, very interesting and, and Steve, he has raised the profile of the mayor and the city region in the past five years, so well done. A couple of questions, really. Looking back and looking forward, in personal terms, what's been the most difficult challenge you've had to face as mayor, and how well have you coped with it, do you think? And looking forward, um, linking two papers, your plan for prosperity, I think, is a terrific document, hugely ambitious. I'm on record as saying the white paper levelling up is one of the weakest white papers you've had, certainly the longest, um, 20 times as long as the best one in 76. Um, lack of clarity, cash and commitment. But it does at the end say um, there's now going to be a, a elaborate process of consultation, ministers, independent levelling up. What are you going to do at the city regional level to be clear about what you want in terms of either powers or pounds or people, you know, powers, resource and capacity, and how are you going to get it out of government? What's going to be your ask and offer? Because it is a weak document, but there is a door open. So how are you going to kind of exploit it? Okay, great. Um, yeah, do you want to, so we'll take the other two questions on this row, sure. Hi, I'm Emma Antrimus, Institution of Civil Engineers. Um, procurement of infrastructure uh, it's a really complex area, and it's based on a cost profile, usually not a value profile. Do you think you've got enough power within the region to build social value and carbon reduction into procurement, um, and, and particularly around that innovation piece? Um, is that part of a devolution ask, or could the government do more to support regions? Okay, great. And then, yeah, we've got one more here then. Oh, there's two more there. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, 
My name's Liam, I'm from an organization called UK 100. I think it's uh, thematically linked to the, the last question, but um, Liverpool City Region has signed up to some um, really good and um, progressive net zero um, pledges. I just wondered if you had some examples of the powers and projects you've been able to use and implement to help achieve those and what barriers you think still exist to leveling up uh, climate action in the region. Great. Okay, fine. And that's helpful. I'll just um, <laughs> bring you in, sir. But there was an online question from uh, Nicola, no surname. Similarly, what role do you think Metro mayors should play in delivering net zero? So I was going to put that one to you anyway, Steve, so I'll just mention that. And uh, yeah, we'll take one more. Is that okay? We've got yeah, yeah. throwing a few at you at once. Okay, very quickly. Uh, Tim Helm, European Movement, Merseyside. It's an international question. You've given a wonderful talk today about how Liverpool is leading the way in many projects within the UK and plans going forward. How can you leverage and what can Liverpool City Region do to put this message out across internationally, and I'm thinking particularly within the European Union, particularly building upon the fact, as you highlighted, that we were the, sadly the last European capital of culture. So how can the Liverpool City Region play an international role so that maybe we bypass the problems in central government in London and get inward investment from abroad. Terrific. Okay, over to you, Steve. Okay, um, start with Michael, uh, and um, thanks for um, your generous comments about the, uh, the plan that we've got for prosperity. The reason that w we went for plan for prosperity is because it links to the other part of your question. Some of the most difficult decisions that anyone's going to have to take happened to us in October 2020. And we had the highest infection rates in the country, but they were the third highest infection rates in some parts of our city region in the whole of Europe. Uh, and at that stage, it, it would have been easier for me um, to afford the government. But we had to do something. And by the way, the government played party political um, point scoring games with me and Andy Burnham. Greater Manchester were in a completely different um, set of circumstances. They'd been in lockdown for nine or 10 weeks. Uh, and so that's why he was saying, hang on a second, we've had nine or 10 weeks, now you want to put us into a high tier. We need some support for what's previously gone on. And he was right. But people would have expected me uh, as you know a proud socialist to have fought a Tory government and to have said we, we're not going to work in collaboration. But we couldn't do that because People, people would have died. We were talking about lives. So instead, we worked on a plan to try to ensure that we got infection rates down, demonstrably we achieved, and to protect livelihoods. So we wanted a package of support because we knew that there would be a recovery phase and we wanted to get through that. So we wanted survival first, recovery, growth, and prosperity. And that's, that's the way we approached it. Um, and we didn't just do it ourselves. We had our universities and everybody else modeling stuff. We had the Mayside Resilience Forum working with us. So it wasn't just politicians in isolation saying, we think this is the right thing or not. The modeling that was done demonstrated that if we went into a higher tier by Christmas, we'd come out. And that's the golden month, as you know. That's where up to a third of all profits are made. Uh, and we did. I mean, genuinely, if you follow where we were on the trajectory, we came out just in time, and then the government put us into a lower tier. We were the only area in the country that went from a higher tier to a lower tier. I think that demonstrated some maturity to central government. And, and then when they were looking for an area to pilot mass testing, they came here, surprisingly to everybody, but not, not necessarily to me. So I think that that's the, well, they are the most difficult things. There's a report, by the way, that's being commissioned that we're having a look at. Um, those decisions uh, and what that meant economically because we took decisions and then you know what were uh, the financial uh, outputs from that just to let you know that uh, on level it up and, and the thing grew that is the white paper Michael Gove is visiting Liverpool city region in April uh, I came for the convention of the north mm -hmm. when I, I hosted that here again um, it was an opportunity to, to try to explain to them some of the things we're doing and to potentially open the door again for some of that innovation um, funding because I think that's really important to the city region. Um, how are we going to explain it? it? I think this again uh, links to, to Tim's point. 
we've got a great story to tell. At times, we've had a mixed narrative, if we're absolutely honest. You know, we're great at everything, and, you know, oh, you've got one of them, we can do that. And instead of concentrating on our strengths, so we're, we're going to Mippen in a, a few weeks' um, time, week after next, I think, or whatever. We're going over there with confidence um, to demonstrate that things that have happened uh, recently, the Calor Report, for instance, we can put a line underneath that and we can move on that if you are going to invest in the Liverpool City region, that there's something tangible here that you can invest in. So we're going to change, hopefully, those people's misperceptions of what's happened and try and get FDI um, up to the level it should be. We're, we're way behind where we should be in with investments is really low. So on, on that comms role, uh, Tim, um, we're also, myself and Andy Burnham, are heading up um, a joint delegation. It's the first time, I think, ever that two Metro mayors, but two you know, um, regional leads have taken the role instead of national government. It's normally national government and, and a new role and behind. But let's face it, we're going to Ireland and brand Liverpool in Ireland is much stronger than anything that England could offer or even the UK. And the same with Manchester, Greater Manchester. So them two things will head it up and that's a trade delegation, but it's also about um, the, the future prosperity stuff. So the green industrial revolution and fourth industrial revolution uh, and also about culture as well, cultural links and how we can both benefit from that. Um, uh, the Taoiseach's doing the Deputy Prime Minister's doing it, uh, the Youth Ram's doing it. Um, um, so everybody's involved in that at a national government level in Ireland. They're really looking forward to it. I think again, that will start to raise the profile that we're genuinely open for business. Uh, and I think you, you, your question on procurement, I, I just thought that was dead easy. You, you want something, you can buy it, and then you have to go through some of the procurement process and you think, my goodness me, who, who came up with all this? And obviously it's very intelligent people like you and, and lawyers um, who've come <laughs> up with this and make it very, very difficult for us. But I understand the reasons, because we've just mentioned Cala. So procurement is really important to us and the way we procure stuff here in the city region. Um, and we're trying to do things slightly differently because we want local supply chains to really benefit. So if you have a look, for instance, at we, what we're doing, I mentioned before, Ali, about um, the, the stuff on retrofitting. The first thing that we thought when there was a likelihood that there'd be a, a bid and war for a pot of money was to say, how can Liverpool companies benefit from that, people in the city region benefit from that? And it was to certificate the companies first so that they could procure the, um, the, the works and then to get local supply chains and local labour and all that stuff. So, so that, that's how we've worked ar around some of that. And then on um, Liam's point on UK 100 and um, net zero barriers and, and the, the question that mm. you've been asked there, um, we need another several hours because mm. Liverpool City region, I'd say, is miles ahead of anywhere in the country, anywhere else in the country. So you hear the North East muted all the time. That's because Ben Houchen is a, is, is a Tory mayor in North East. Good on him, but they're nowhere near what we're doing on, for instance, on hydrogen. And there's a debate nationally and internationally about blue and grey and green hydrogen, but just park that one for a second. But on, on hydrogen, high net in uh, the Northwest, that can send us stratospheric. So what are we doing? Well, we're starting to build the infrastructure so that hopefully if we can harness the power of the River Mersey uh, and turn that into uh, renewable energy, part of it through electrolysis or hydrolysis or whatever, we'll get green hydrogen. So that's the big prize for us to get green hydrogen. But it's no good waiting until that happens to do the infrastructure bit. So that's going in now with, with, with our hydrogen buses, which we'll have before the end of this year. There are uh, fueling stations that we're putting across the city region, and they will not be just able to be used for our buses, but hoping that new vehicles in the future that will be procured by our local authorities, they'll be able to use them, and other people will be able to, to use this. So we'll have a source for the energy, and then we need to get the correct mix of the, the energy. And um, in industry, in heavy uh, energy-intensive industries, We've just trialled the first uses of hydrogen 
in Pilkington's, so it was a world first trial, and it was 100% successful in Pilkington's glass. And not only content with that, uh, a few weeks last week, I went over to Unilever, and they trialled the second trial in the Liverpool City region, and that was successful as well. So mm. we've now got a blueprint with something called Glass Futures, which is about those energy intensive industries, about decarbonisation, transport, we're doing it, domestic uh, gas supplies, we're looking at, at that. So on every measure, every indicator, we're miles ahead of anyone, and that's before we hopefully get to a business case stage in a few years for the River Mersey uh, to harness its power. Mm. But as gas prices go up, energy scheme. Yeah. As, as gas prices are going up, mm. that's become a more and more viable for us. And also, of course, it's secure, and we haven't got to rely on, on a, a, a maniac despot, have we, to, to get our, our gas. Yeah. You know. As long as the moon keeps turning, you're going to have a We'll tide. be all right, yeah. we'll be all right with the tides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless yeah. Houston stops it all, of course. <laughs> Okay, um, well, we are sadly out of time, but um, Steve, thanks so much for, for, for spending the time to, to talk through all that wide range of issues. It's been really interesting. Thank you all to, uh, also to everybody who's joined online and um, in person. Um, as mentioned, this is the first in a series. We will be in Leeds um, on the 15th of March, so next Tuesday with um, Tracy Brabin, Mayor of West Yorkshire. We'll then be in uh, Newcastle with uh, Jamie Driscoll on the 27th of April, and hopefully there'll be further such events uh, later in the spring and summer. So um, that's all from us today. Thank you for joining. Hope to see you again. Thanks, Akash. Mm. <laughs>